So I'm sure you've heard of N.T. Wright by now. He's very popular. He wrote many different books. The guy's a genius. He's he's scholarly, well-educated. Uh, he's been a pastor for a long time. I believe it's with the Anglican Church. Uh, he has a kind of a cool accent. I think that's why a lot of the younger crowd enjoys him. And I've heard even uh, one of my pastors, he was a young pastor at my church, and he just talked about how much he loved him. He goes, that's great. that guy's my favorite teacher. And he would travel for many miles just to listen to him speak. And he does have a lot of good things to say. The guy's a, you know, he's a true Christian, obviously, and he has some great insights into the New and Old Testament. Um, but there is one area that I disagree with him on, and that's the area of eschatology. What you, eschatology is the study of end times belief and what the scriptures say about that. And I'm going to show you how I disagree with him respectfully. I love the man. I think he's a fellow brother, but I do disagree with him, and it's okay to disagree. <laughs> you could disagree with me on this channel and comment down below if you wish all your disagreements, or if you agree, feel free to comment, you guys, and subscribe. You won't miss anything. Right now, we're, we're going through a series called Jesus in the Old Testament, and you don't want to miss that because we're looking at how Christ is pictured in portraits and pictures of him and types in the Old Testament. Jesus himself said it all spoke of him. So that's what we're doing. We're finding that. And Jesus, uh, we can see Joseph, Jesus and Joseph's story and Moses' story. And what's interesting about it is they both had Gentile brides and then they save all of Israel. Israel rejects them the first time, right? Then they have a Gentile bride in a Gentile land and then they come back and they save Israel. Israel, both stories. So that's part of how I agree and the reason I agree, disagree, excuse me, with N.T. Wright on his eschatology. We're going to look at that right now. So let's go into the presentation here. So N.T. Wright quotes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and this is the rapture verses that we find in the Bible. And he says this, he says, at Jesus coming or appearing, those who are still alive will be changed or transformed. He's quoting out of that scripture right there. N.T. Wright also says, so that their mortal bodies will become incorruptible and deathless. That's true. That's a true statement. This is all, he said, this is all that Paul intends to say in Thessalonians. But here he borrows imagery from biblical and political sources. So what he's trying to say is that that Paul's just saying that, you know, it's about a new creation and Paul's using metaphor, like he's spiritualizing this. He doesn't mean literally that we're all going to be caught up to be in the air with the Lord, like the scripture says. He's saying that it's spiritual, it's allegorical, symbolic. Well, you have to be careful with that because that's what a lot of the early church uh, heretics like Origen and others out of Alexandria started saying they over spiritualized the scriptures, and we don't want to do that. You don't want to get caught doing that. You only do it where it's intended to be done, and that can be tricky, right? I mean, you know, well, then where, when, you know, well, we're going to look more into that. So let's keep going on this whole uh, presentation. So here we see N.T. Wright says to S to enhance his message. Remember, he just previously he said that. Um, it's all, uh, uh, Paul intended it. He borrows imagery, right? Imagery from biblical and political sources. And then he says, and he writes, says to enhance his message. That's why he was doing that. He also said, little did Paul know, and I'm quoting here, little did Paul know how his colorful metaphors for Jesus' second coming would be misunderstood two millennia later. In other words, 2,000 years later, like our time. He's saying that little did Paul know how his colorful metaphors, right? His imagery and spiritualizing the scriptures, what he's saying for Jesus' second coming would be misunderstood 2,000 years later. I don't think so. And I don't think if it's scripture, little did Paul know that this would all be misunderstood 2,000 years later. It's like Paul was making a mistake almost, right? That's what he's saying. It's not like that at all. Those were not meant to be metaphors. I'm going to prove it to you. So all of Paul's teaching on the second coming were metaphorical? No. So allegorical, metaphorical are synonyms. Like 
one of them's a little bit longer than the other and um you know but they're both uh it's like it, it doesn't really mean this it means something else and there are places in the bible where we see that right you know, Jesus used metaphors, Paul did too. But when that happens, it's told that way. Like when Jesus said, hear this parable. A parable is a like a metaphor or an allegorical story to show something that's uh, true. It's a symbolic type story to show something that's true. And that's, you have to be careful with that kind of stuff because you can just you can allegorize, allegorize the entire Bible, right? You could make, say everything is symbolic. You could say Genesis isn't really literal. That's just all symbolic and spiritual. You have to be very careful, guys. Okay, so allegorizing and spiritualizing, over-spiritualizing the scripture. So allegorizing just means spiritualizing it, okay? But we don't want to overdo that. So in the third and fourth century, here's the proof, guys. In the third and fourth century, century, right? The very first part of right after when Jesus died and rose from the dead. Uh, I'm sorry, a couple hundred years after that. Okay, that's this this is where we see the the it was misinterpreted. The Alexandrian interpretive school started to allegorize or over allegorizing the scriptures. That's what happened. That's where these were actually heretics. So starting with origin of Alexandria in 185 to 254 AD. Okay, so this is a few hundred years. I know I said earlier, right after Jesus, I was wrong. This is a few hundred years after, right? After uh, the early church. Okay, that's what we're seeing here, these guys. And starting with Origen, okay? He was one of the head uh, leading scholarly men out of Alexandria. Another one was Augustine, and he was later at 354 to 430 AD. Okay, those are hundreds of years. AD means Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. That's Latin for the year of our Lord, the year he was born. So we're looking at 350 to 430 years after Jesus was born. This guy came much later. And these guys were responsible for over-spiritualizing or allegorizing books like the book of Revelation. There is a lot of symbolic stuff in Revelation, but it speaks of an actual true future event. How do I know that? Because Jesus said it's prophecy, right? And it was written in 95 to 96 AD, around 100 AD, not before 70 AD as, as these guys think, guys like N.T. Wright. So we're going to look at that. Let's check it out. So allegorizing, spiritualizing the scriptures birthed what is called anti-millennialism, or you might have heard it as amillennialism, or I'm an amillennialist, someone might say. That means anti, the millennial means thousand, right? The thousand-year reign. It means they're against there being a thousand-year reign of Christ. So Wright fundamentally rejects the notion of a future restored Jewish kingdom, okay? A future restored Jewish kingdom, that means the thousand-year reign physically, Jesus coming down physically and ruling and reigning from Jerusalem in this world for a thousand years. And it's actually mentioned six times in seven verses in Revelation, which means, in my opinion, that's literal, my friend. He believes in replacement theology. He is an amillennialist, okay? He's not the only one. And it doesn't mean he's not a believer, so don't think he's a heretic and he's not a believer. I'm not saying that. I think he's a, a brother in Christ. I think he's just misled in this part of the scriptures. Even though he's a genius, even though he's well-educated and he's scholarly and he's written many, many very popular and very successful books. It's still, I think he's wrong on this. I'm going to show you more and prove it to you. Here we go. However, right, however, he believes that there's no millennial reign of Christ physically on this earth. The thousand-year reign is mentioned six times in seven verses in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Millennium basically means, biblically, it means the thousand-year reign of Christ. So, what did the early, early church believe? They were pre-millennium. That means they believe that Jesus, it means Jesus returns before the 1,000-year reign 
from Jerusalem. The early church believed Jesus' premillennium return. In the first three centuries, this was the main view of the church. For the first three centuries, that's old. That's the earliest part, you guys. That's Augustine was what? Remember, 350, born in 350. He was later, he, he was part of the, uh, the, with Constantine, right? The Roman church that became like the official church of the government. And before that, origin out of Alexandria, those, a lot of those guys, they didn't even believe. They were Gnostics. And they were called heretics by the Nicene Council. So here we see it. For the first three centuries, they believed that Jesus would come before the thousand-year reign of Christ. That is what the church believed. Jesus is coming back to earth to set up his kingdom, they said. This is what the earliest church fathers and the early church believe, starting with Papias. Papias was from 60 to 130 AD. He believed that. Justin Martyr, same thing. He believed that also, that Jesus was going to come before the thousand-year reign of Christ, come down physically and rule and reign from Jerusalem. Irenaeus, also one of the early church fathers. Tertullian, also one of the earliest church fathers. Hippolytus, or Hippolytus, excuse me. So Papias, this guy, the one that we mentioned first, he was discipled by the apostle John himself. Wow. And he believed that Jesus was coming back before the thousand-year reign Christ. He said, there will be a millennium when the kingdom of Christ is established on earth, he said. And I quote, Justin Martyr also said, he said, Jerusalem will be rebuilt just as Ezekiel and Isaiah declared. The only ones, he said, the only ones who do not believe that are the Gnostic heretics. Whoa. Those are strong words from the church fathers. Now, I'm not calling N.T. Wright a heretic. Don't get me wrong here. I'm saying we got to be careful of over-spiritualizing the scriptures. So the Gnostic heretics, Paul's mixed metaphors of trumpet blowing and living, the living being snatched into heaven to meet the Lord are not to be misunderstood, N.T. Wright said, as literal truth. Those are his words, and I was quoting. So Israel, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says in Ezekiel 36 and 37 that Israel returns from the four corners of the world, that God will bring them back together. We're seeing that in our time, you guys. And today, this is what Israel looks like. It's this little tiny nation about the size of New Jersey, right? And and surrounded by enemies. But God miraculously rebirthed this nation again. Isn't that crazy that this would happen in our lifetime? I'm amazed by that, that God actually did this. The problem with a lot of amillennialist teaching or preterist is another one of them. And they, they, some of them call themselves uh, supersessionists, like, like God just used Israel, basically, is what they think, to birth the Messiah. They rejected Jesus, and God has rejected them. This is what they believe. And they believe that, that God uh, allowed Uh, the temple to be destroyed in 70 AD, which he may have, but it didn't mean he hated the Jewish people and he was done with them and rejecting them. That's not what it means. These guys need to read Romans chapter 11, where Paul says, is God done with it? Is he finished with the Jewish people, with Israel? And he says, absolutely not. I'm paraphrasing there, but emphatically, he says, of course not. Read it, Romans chapter 11. You'll be amazed. So God is not done with Israel, my friend. He's not done. And (laughs) Jesus, by the way, is Jewish. I worship a Jewish God, a Jewish Messiah. And we need to love Israel. And I know it's not popular today, this whole you know thing of being against nationalism. Nationalism is evil. It's a sin. You shouldn't be into nationalism. Where in the Bible does it say that? It doesn't. I think it's okay to love America. I'm an American. I love America. I think it's okay to, to, to love Scotland if you're from Scotland. It's okay to love 
uh, Africa, if you're from Africa or India or the, any of these places, it's okay to love your nation. But it's really important as a believer, you need to love Israel because God loves Israel. They're the apple of his eye. And prophecy tells us he has a plan to save them, to save them. Yes. Read Ezekiel 36, 37. Read Romans chapter 11, and you will see God's heart toward Israel. Hey, don't forget, you might want to hit this playlist right here. How to find Jesus in the Old Testament. It'll bless your heart. Um, Click on this playlist right here. I guarantee you'll love it. God bless you all.